Okay, it's just about five past three, so let's get started. Uh, I'm Skip Darmody from the College of Continuing Studies, and I'd like to introduce our presenters uh, who'll just um, say a little bit about themselves. I'm the Director of Marketing here at the College of Continuing Studies. Uh, we have Dr. John Cash with us today. Uh, my name is Dr. John Cash. I am a chairperson of special education uh, and uh, one of the advisors for uh, this program. Uh, we also have Dr. Sheena Manuel. Hi, I'm Dr. Sheena Manuel. I'm the assistant professor, or one of the assistant professors in special education. I'll be one of the first faces you see. And just to give you a little background about me personally, I was once in some of you all's shoes. I was a paraprofessional before I started into this field. Great. And we also have Robin Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Robin Ryan, and I am the Associate Director here in the College of Continuing Studies, and I will help you through the admissions process should you decide to take those next steps and join Dr. Dr. Cash, Dr. Manuel, and the wonderful team in the special education program. Great, thank you, Robin. So uh, our presentation will last roughly 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, we'll just give you a brief overview of Bridgewater State University and the College of Continuing Studies. Uh, and Dr. Cash and Dr. Manuel will talk about the special education program and the paraprofessional grant program. And Robin will talk a little bit about the admissions process, transferring credits to BSU, uh, and then some of the services that we provide our College of Continuing Studies students. Just want to point out this webinar uh, will be recorded. We do record our webinars and we usually post them. Um, so if you, you can ask a question uh, after the presentation, we're going to open the microphones if you like to verbally ask a question. But also on your little dashboard, you should see an area where you can type in a question. Um, we'll try to answer some of those as we go along and we'll also address those at the uh, the end of the presentation. Um, so let's just start off with a little bit about BSU. So BSU is um, you know, located in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Um, we usually have about anywhere between 8,500 to 9,500 undergraduate students uh, enrolled at the university. That includes our daytime students our, and our continuing study students who are night and online students. Our faculty to student ratio is 19 to one. Um, and in some of our night classes, you'll find that uh, it's an even smaller ratio. Um, but just to give you a sense that you're not going to be sitting in a lecture hall with 500 people listening to a lecture. Um, you know, we, we most of our classes are 25 to 30 students, so you get to know the faculty members uh, really, really well, and particularly in special education, um, uh, you'll you'll know your faculty members. Um, so it's it's not you're not just a number; you're a face and a person at BSU. Also, we have a huge network, 50,000 alumni. Um, you, know, you may not know, but Bridgewater State has been around since 1840. We started out as what was called a normal school. Um, our roots are in education. The normal schools were designed to train people to become teachers, and we've uh, kept that heritage along. We have one of the strongest education programs in the state. Um, and you, I doubt you'll be able to go to, into any school, at least in southeastern Massachusetts or south of Boston, and not run into a teacher or an administrator who uh, didn't do their undergraduate or their master's uh, degree program with Bridgewater State University. Our continuing studies program, that includes our night and our online students. Um, usually our continuing studies students uh, are very busy working. They may be parents, they may be juggling a job, maybe two jobs. Um, this may not be their first time going to college. A lot of times it's not. Sometimes uh, we've seen students who have, this is their third or fourth attempt and there's no problem with that. Sometimes life gets in the way. Um, but we're used to working with students who are transferring credits from different institutions and we're happy to work with you uh, to make sure that BSU is the right fit. Uh, our continuing studies, the profile of our student, average age is about 33 years old. So um, you can see most of our students are adult students. Uh, and a lot of our students are part-time. 
student. So um, with BSU, there's no minimum credits or no per se maximum credits you can take in a semester. If you want to take uh, one or two courses a semester, that's fine. If you want to take four, five, six courses a semester, that, that's fine as well. Whatever thing you think that you can best handle with, with your situation. Um, and just the profile, we offer, uh, it's actually about 550 night and online courses through continuing studies. Um, you'll find, uh, you know, our population is very mixed. So our, our day students can also take night and online courses. So you'll see your classes may be mixed with students. Um, but the older students tend to take the night and online courses. Uh, we offer a summer session each year, uh, two five-week sessions. So each summer we offer about 400 courses, a wide, wide variety, just about every major office uh, courses during the summer. We have a winter intercession. That's the period between the fall and the spring semester. It's a very rigorous three to four week semester, um, packs a lot in, but it's a good opportunity for some students to continue to um, Earn credits even while there's a winter break. And last but not least, our continuing study students can mix night and online courses. So um, whatever um, schedule works best for you, however you want to align it, um, there's no restrictions on mixing night or online courses. You can also take a day course if you'd like. Um, that's fine if you can fit into your schedule. We don't put walls up between uh, our continuing studies and our day students. All right. And last but not least, the question we get all the time. Well, if I if I go through, you know, get my degree at night, is it the same as someone who goes through the day? Absolutely. There's no difference. A night and online programs, the degree uh, is the same as the day program. You're following the same curriculum, the same requirements, the same coursework. Uh, same professors, mostly. A lot of our professors who teach during the faculty who teach during the day also teach at night and online, like Professor Cash um, and uh, Professor Manuel, um, and also the same rigor. So when you get your diploma, uh, even though you've gone through as a night or an online student, it's the same diploma as someone who went through the day program. There's absolutely no difference. And with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, our special ed faculty to talk about our special ed programs. Thank you, Skip. And like you all heard, this is the same program that every other student will be a part of. So we wanted to share with you the program tracks that we have available in special education. So you can either specialize in moderate disabilities or severe disabilities. If you're interested in moderate disabilities, you can pick the track either pre-K to eighth grade or fifth through 12th grade. With the severe disabilities, that's considered all levels. So you'll be um, specializing in grades pre-K to 12th grade. Um, if you had any knowledge about BSU, so some people know that it used to be a thing where your special education teacher candidates had to have a double major. Right now, that is no longer a requirement. A double major is not required for specific programs. And you will see I have an asterisk by the two that, um, that do not require a double major. If you are interested in the moderate disabilities in grades five through 12, you will be required to have a double major. But if you're interested in moderate disabilities pre-K through eighth grade, or the severe disabilities, all levels, you will not need a double major. It's not required. But if you're interested in having one, by certainly you can do that. Here are three of the requirements that we want to share with you about our special education program. The first one is that you must complete an appropriate developmental psychology course. So I know some students that I've had the pleasure of speaking with. They're coming from dis different institutions, transferring some of those credits in. So if you have a course that speaks to child psychology or developmental psychology, you can bring that in and that will count toward this requirement. Or you can take our special education course 208. You also have to take SPED 202, which is the introduction to special education and pass with the grade of a B minus. Again, if you're transferring in some credits and you've taken an introduction to special education, you may have the opportunity to um, 
use that credit toward this requirement. And then the third thing that's very important is that you've passed the communication and literacy MTELs. Here on this slide is a flow chart. It's a little blurry, but we can provide this to you via email if you're interested. But I just wanted you to get an idea of what it would look like throughout your years in the moderate pre-K-8 major. In the red, you will see all of the SPED courses that you will take. In the purple, you will see the MTEL test that you have to take and pass. In the freshman year, you'll see that you have to take that communication and literacy MTEL because that's your admission to professional education program. Before you can start taking those upper level classes, you have to have these MTELs taken and passed. So the earlier you start, the better. On the next slide, you'll find some information about uh, the pre-practicum on that flow chart you'll find the practicum piece in blue. But before you get to your pre-practicum, and some people will hear or understand the terminology of pre-student teaching. So when you hear student teaching, I want you to start thinking about practicum. Those are the same thing. They mean the same thing. When you, before you get to your practicum, you have to complete all the licensure courses in special education. It depends on the track that you're taking. So you're either taking 30 or 33 credits. You have to pass that general curriculum and math subtest. And this is before you start your practicum. You have to pass the foundations of reading MTEL. And then there's a note for students who are in the severe all levels. They will complete only the general curriculum and math subtest. We have this built into our flow chart, so we remind you also the other faculty, we are aware and we try to stay on top of our students to be sure that you know when is a good time to take your test, um, resources that may be available to take these MTELs, and, and just helping you along the way with that process because we know that can be challenging sometimes for some people. Once you've completed all of those requirements, then you'll move on to practicum. And just two things I want you to be aware of. There's a lot of information that we can share with you, but this is just a general overview. You will complete your practicum experience in an appropriate setting. So if you're in moderate, in the moderate program, pre-K to eight grade, then you will be conducting your practicum in one of those grades and in that setting, in the moderate setting. Also, if you are getting ready to become a paraprofessional or you're already a paraprofessional working in the school districts, you may have the opportunity to do an employment-based practicum. So instead of doing 16 weeks of practicum, you'll do eight weeks. Now, we want you to be excited because this does sound like it's too good to be true, but it is true and it is good. And I'm telling you, as a paraprofessional who has, has worked her way up to this level, this is exactly what you need and want. And that's going to help you to excel even further because guess what? You don't have to worry about the cost. So there's a paraprofessional grant offered um, from the Massachusetts Higher Education Institute. And here are some of the requirements to be eligible for that grant. But I wanted to highlight two that are important because there's a list of, of um, requirements that you can read on your own. But first, you have to fill out that FAFSA, that free application for federal student aid. So this is just to give you an idea of what other grants that may be out there that you have access to. But you have to fill this out in order to access these grant funds. Also, you have to be enrolled in an undergraduate program, either full-time or part-time. And in the continuing studies program that is offered to you, you can be a full-time student or a part-time student, but it will lead to teacher certification in a Massachusetts public college. Some additional information about the paraprofessional grant that I want to draw your attention to is if you're employed less than two years as a paraprofessional, so let's say you're getting ready to start your paraprofessional job this fall, you need to be sure that you are taking an undergraduate course of study that leads to either math, science, special education, 
on any one of these on the list. And if you're interested in special education, then you're covered. Also, you have to sign a terms and conditions statement. That is saying that you will commit to teaching in Massachusetts public schools for a minimum of two years with a maximum of four years. If you do not abide by that term and condition statement or contract, you will have to repay those funds. And if you're already here and you're working in the school district, this will not be a hard thing to do. So we wanted to give you an idea of some of the things that you can look forward to with this paraprofessional grant program. And we also have a link that we'll share with you and you can find on our webpage that can take you through the process of applying and learning more about this. And now we'll have Mrs. Ryan to tell you more about the admissions process. I'm muted again, I did it. I can't believe it. I, I promised myself I wasn't going to um, talk and be muted at the same time. Um, thank you, Dr. Manuel. Uh, you know, every time I, I go through one of these presentations, I learn something new. So I have new notes and I can add them to my other information. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking some time to join us this afternoon. Um, I am Robin Ryan, and I am going to be your point person should you decide to take these next steps and join Bridgewater State. Some of you may have already started the process and needed more information, so I'm here to try to help provide some of that. We still have time to enroll for the fall semester, so if you're thinking and you've kind of been going back and forth, you still have time. And even if you decide you, you complete your application and, and it's for fall and something happens, it's not a problem. We can help you take those next steps just to defer until spring or until you're ready. So don't let the timing necessarily stop you. If you're thinking about it, go ahead and apply. And, and I can help you through that process. A lot of students um, come and, and one of their first questions is, you know, I'm really nervous. I, I haven't been in school for a while. I have transfer credits. Will my credits transfer? And the answer is yes. One of the great things about Bridgewater State is academic credit doesn't die. So we will accept those credits from five months ago, five years ago, 15 years ago. If you have credits from a two year institution or community college, that you'd like to transfer in, we can accept up to 69 of those credits. And if you went to a four-year institution and did not complete, but you've done you know, 70 or 80 credits, we can accept up to 90 credits from a four-year institution. And we can accept up to 90 if you have both a two-year and a four-year. So some of you may have gone to uh, Bristol Community College and taken, you know, maybe 60 credits and then you transferred to UMass Dartmouth and life changed and you didn't complete but you earned another 20 there. Chances are we're going to be able to do something with those 80 credits for you and bring them right over to help support you getting to your um, graduation or degree completion. The other big question I get is, you know, I don't know, my GPA may not be so good. How do I know if I'm going to get accepted? We, we have kind of a blanket. So if you've earned 24 or more credits from another institution that you would be transferring in, we are looking for you to have an overall GPA of 2.0. That is for entry into the university. Once you get into your program, that will change. There are some certain criteria that you will need to continue to meet in order to stay in the program. If you have less than 24 credits, we are looking for a 2.5 overall GPA. If you're sitting there and you're listening and you're saying, well, that wasn't me, don't let that deter you. We have other avenues that we can chat one-on-one -on -one about. Um, I know I had my hiccups early on in my education and somebody was willing to take the time and talk about options with me and we're here to do that same for you. So 
don't let the GPA scare you. Um, don't let the transfer credit piece scare you. Uh, we can work through that together. Hi, Robin. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Do you want to mention the uh, the I waiver? I forgot, I forgot the waiver and I forgot the no SA, no SAT. So thanks, Skip. Um, one of the other things that's really helpful with applying to the College of Continuing Studies is it's really easy to do. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to actually complete the online application. The good news is there is no SA and we do not require SAT scores. So those are two less things on your plate that you have to complete. And at the end, um, for participating in today's event, you will get um, a, a waiver code uh, for the application. Our normal application fee is $10, but we're going to make sure that you get the code so you are not charged for the application um, should you decide to apply. The next big questions that we often get is how am I going to afford this and one of the fantastic things about being a paraprofessional is the ability to take um, advantage of the paraprofessional grant through through Massachusetts um, and again as Dr. Manuel said there are links on our web pages to help you through that process um, we can certainly help talk you or guide you as best we can um, to take those next steps as well. But just so that you have an idea, if you were taking a, and this is as of um, this last academic year, 2021, however, I do not believe that um, there has been a fee increase, but please don't quote me on that. That's um, correct, Robin, it's same price. Okay. So for a three credit course on campus or in a hybrid format, and we'll talk a little bit about if you're not familiar with what the hybrid format is, uh, you're looking at about 1300, 1329.75. Um, there is an additional $25 student fee per semester. If you are looking to take the course online 100%, then there is a technology fee that is built in and the, the cost of a three credit class is the 140475. One of the things for the paraprofessional grant you heard Dr. Manuel refer to was financial aid. And you do need to apply for financial aid in order to be eligible for the, for the grant. However, we also strongly encourage you to apply for financial aid, regardless if you think you're going to use it or not. It's always good to know what you're eligible for and it does not affect your credit score. So that's the other big question that we often get is, oh, if I apply, uh, you know, my credit isn't that great. It's not going to affect your credit score. So we certainly encourage you to go ahead and apply. In order to use financial aid, you do need to carry at least six credits to be eligible. But if you are not utilizing financial aid um, and you, are not utilizing the opportunity with the grant. Um, certainly, if you want to pay and you're paying out of pocket, there are payment uh, plans available. We would put you in touch with, directly in touch with student accounts to help you set up a, a comfortable plan for you. So, just like our, our traditional day students, we also have um, many resources available. Many of the resources are overlapping. Um, we do have specific uh, academic advisors who are available at night and online. I know that both Dr. Manuel and Dr. Cash have been amazing um, at working with students and their various schedules. They understand you all have a life, you have work, you have family, you're trying to juggle the, the decision to return back to school. Um, it's a lot on your plate and, and we know that and we understand it. So we're here to work with you and advise you as best we can at a mutually uh, convenient time for everybody. Some of the other great pieces about being a continuing study student is you do have access to early registration. So two, uh, 
approximately 48 hours prior to the whole university being able to go on and register for classes, you have the ability to go into the InfoBear registration system and register for any continuing studies night or online class. And we help show you which classes those are. They have special designations in the registration system, but you have that ability. So if you need an online class, you don't have to worry about another, uh, about you know the senior getting that, that seat when they are a traditional day student and you are a working adult who needs that online or that evening seat in the class. So we do have that opportunity, which is, has been fantastic. And our students, it's, it's fairly new. And our students are, are really, the feedback is, is so positive about being able to have that not being shut out from those classes that they need. We have a dedicated staff in continuing studies who only focus on continuing studies students. Our, our pool of students is a, a bit smaller in comparison to our traditional undergraduate colleagues. Uh, our day student population. So we have the ability to really work one-on-one -on -one with you. We're there um, to help you get connected with the different departments if that's what you need. Uh, we, we have somebody that you can just talk to um, because you're having difficulty getting connected with student accounts. We're there to help with all of those little hiccups along the way. Um, we, we have library services, there's a tutoring and writing center, and we also have a program, um, and I believe uh, we have a representative who is here, and I think she's going to jump in, so I'll just mention, we, we partner with a program called Journey into Education and Teaching, the JET program, who also provides some additional resources um, to our students. Again, just to kind of wrap up, we have career services, internship opportunities, there are opportunities to study abroad. And I know when you think study abroad, you know, you're probably sitting there going, oh my God, there is no way I can take a semester and, and go away to, to study. Uh, sometimes they're not um, necessarily going overseas and especially now in COVID times, travel people are still very leery, which is completely understandable, but there may be opportunities to go to another state for a short period of time, perhaps a week. Uh, so there might be other opportunities for you when we say study abroad. We have a continuing studies resource website, which is just a wealth of information. You can pretty much find anything that you need there. And last but not least, if you are coming to campus for classes and you are coming right from work, um, one of the great things that we do have is we have multiple opportunities to grab a bite to eat or a cup of coffee, just to kind of decompress from your job and get ready to take on that that next task of being in class. So there's a multitude of resources for you um, and we are all here to help and support you. I am going to um, wrap it up. Is Pam on with us? Robin, the uh, mics the mics are muted right now, so okay. Let's just see if we can. What's the name? Her first name is Pam. No, but she may be using my link that I shared. No, it wouldn't make a difference. Oh, it wouldn't. Okay. I, I don't think so. Well, let's see. Uh, I can open up the mics for people questions. Uh, we do have a which I will do. Um, we do have a question um, from one of our attendees asked, uh, what if you can't pass the MTEL, do you have to pay the grant back? That's a great question. Yeah, you, you, you will be able to get past the MTEL. Uh, you you you'll be able to pass them. Let's you know don't 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 think about don't think about that. It, that is a very good question that I I, don't, I do not know the answer to that. Uh, I do know that you need to be able to work in a Massachusetts school. I guess if worse came to worse, and you know at the very uh, you you just absolutely 100% positively could not pass the MTELs. 
then uh, that may become an issue. But but everybody eventually passes them. I mean, it it sometimes it takes others more than more than uh, more more than you know once or twice to pass them. Part of our program is we are going to be offering you help with the MTELs. We're going to be offering, uh, we're, we're, we're going to make sure that you have as, as much access as possible to passing, passing the MTELs. So uh, that's while that, that is a 100% absolutely fantastic question, don't let that be a concern to you. Don't let that be a worry to you. We, you know, we've, uh, when, when you're, when you're ready to get to, to get through and get past those entails, we're going to be here to help you. And, uh, to, to our attendees, your mics, uh, have been unmuted by me, um, by us. If you just need to unmute it yourself, if you'd like to ask a question. And if you're on here, Mrs. Pam, please, by all means, just jump in and tell us more about the JET program. Well, we, we do have another question. Uh, if you've already been working as a para for two to five years, do you have to work as a para for an additional two to five years? Uh well, it, yes, for this for this grant, you would have to be employed a, as a paraprofessional. But once you get your teacher's license, you will be a licensed teacher, and you no longer have to work as a paraprofessional once you get your teacher's license. I think I just it, can you hear me? Hi, Pam. Hi. Um, great to see all of you. Uh, so this is Pam Harrop with the JET program that um, Robin was referring to before. And we have been working actually in collaboration with the SPED department of Bridgewater. And we are really thrilled with what they are offering, which in the past has really not been accessible to Paris because they haven't been able to offer the courses either uh, online or in the evening, and now they've done that. So this is opening up a whole new world. Um, we love it that that they're telling you about the paraprofessional grant, um, which has been around for many, many years, but too few people really know about it. Um, it's one of the things that JET does. JET is kind of a wraparound program uh, in terms of support. We recruit uh, paras from our partner districts, which currently in the area of Bridgewater State are Brockton, Fall River, and New Bedford. And uh, we want we help them make their way uh, through their undergraduate degree and teacher licensure. So uh, now Bridgewater is really offering its kind of own wraparound services, which is so critical because the higher ed piece is, um, is, is a must. <laughs> uh, JET offers um, local mentoring uh, for the paras in our program, and that is we pair you with uh, a local educator who will help um, keep you on, on track, give them, you know, share their wisdom, um, be able to answer questions or steer you where you can find answers to your questions. And um, JET also practices a cohort model, so you would meet other paraprofessionals who are on this journey to become teachers um, within your district or your neighboring districts. And we're just about to um, wrap up our program year with uh, our end of end of year meetings. Um, and John, just to mention something uh, that came up again at a meeting I was attending this morning, um, the MTELs are under discussion, so to speak. Um, they, the state is looking at alternatives because they know what, uh, what a barrier this is to too many people who want to become teachers and who have this wonderful classroom experience and capability. 
So um, there is that in the future, but I think it's um, fantastic that Bridgewater is also going to be giving you that critical support of MTEL prep. Uh, that um, you know you'll feel much more confident that you know what these tests are, uh, and that's part of that's always been part of the issue. Is it's kind of um, an unknown, but the familiarity will make a big difference. And Ms. Pam, I, so, I just want to say too, we are working diligently in our department to try throughout the College of Education at Bridgewater State. Uh, they're offering an opportunity to create alternatives to the MTEL. So what that means is you may have to take the MTEL, but if you can't pass the MTEL and you have met certain criteria at the university, uh, you you may be able to get credit for that intel without having to take it and pass it. We're working on that now. So that's why I say don't let the intels be an issue to you. We are working very diligently from, from, from many different directions. And we are also very, very excited to, ha to have our partners in JET. Because while we can meet your needs academically, they meet your needs outside of school so that everybody is working together to support you so that you will become successful. That's our goal. That's the whole goal of putting this together so that you so you know so that you don't feel like you're alone. We want you to be able to work as a paraprofessional with you know and be able to come to school and get your teacher's license because you are the people who are going to make the best special educators. You are the people who are going to have the most experience and you're going to you're the one that's going to create your own opportunity like doc, like Dr. Manuel did when she started out as a paraprofessional. So uh and and I worked as a teacher working with paraprofessionals. So uh we you know we we kind of we we don't may, maybe don't know exactly what you're going through as an individual but we do know how difficult the journey is for you. And it is it is our mission with this program to make sure that everything you need to be successful, we are trying to provide for you. Thank you, Ms. Pam. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I wanted to make sure they knew about the partnership between us and Jen. Yes, and I did want to mention one other thing that some districts are able to um, support you in paying for MTELs. So you should always, you should note that and, and make a point of checking with um, a district administrator in human resources, whether there is funding available to you. Thank you. So we do have a few more questions. Um, uh, how many credits is this degree? I saw that this is a three, three years part time. The credit for the special ed part, uh, it depends on which program you're going into, but it's between 30 or 30. Well, it's not between. It's either 30 credits or 33 credits. And, and to clarify, you do need 120 credits to and you do need to complete our core curriculum in order to uh, earn a degree at Bridgewater State University. And if you're transferring in, you know, that if you're transferring in 90 credits, that will take care of the bulk of what is in your core curriculum. And you would be well on your way when you're entering in, uh, jumping into some of those early special education courses like the intro to SPED and cultural diversity. And uh, let me just clarify the three years. So continuing studies um is designed for part-time students um some departments will put up you know all the court have all the courses available for you to complete the degree in two years but as a minimum um all the courses to complete the degree not the core curriculums but the degree um would be available over a three-year period so that's kind of a generic um generic term we use uh, because many of our students may only take six or nine credits a semester but generally um, you can earn the degree finish your degree uh, requirements within a three-year period 
uh, at night or online or mixing night and online courses, depending on, on how the program offers those. And I think that's a great segue, uh, Skip, into the um, this new dynamic that SPED has created so that students, I believe, Dr. Cash, you call it the high flex model, where students yeah. really have that ability to A, mix and match. Um, they're online, they're on campus, an asynchronous online, a synchronous online to really fit into their schedule so it, it will work. Right, right now, we are working very, very hard to ensure that our, our entire program is online. Uh, that that will be in one 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 of three modes. One is synchronous online. That's where you have to attend class, but you don't have to come to the university at all. Uh, then, well, okay. So let me be be very clear on this. We're trying to design it where you don't have to come to the university unless you want to. Okay. So with the with the synchronous, you get to attend class remotely. And the professor is maybe in their own home, like you see here, could possibly be in a classroom or, or their office. Then we have the hybrid model. For those of you who want to come to campus for some courses because you need that extra help, you need that connection with the professor, uh, you know, maybe you just don't like learning online, which there's a lot of people who just don't like learning online. We, we are having, we're, we're holding your classes at night. And what we're able to do is do it high flex where some can attend class in, in person if they like, or you could attend class remotely, or if one week you need to come to campus or one week you can't come to campus, but you can get home and get online and get to class. You, it all counts. It, it, it's all good. That's that high flex model. And then we have, of course, asynchronous classes. We don't have very many asynchronous classes, but we do have a couple of asynchronous classes where you just take the total class online. We're trying not to have so many of those asynchronous classes because we want you to have the support that you need. But we, you know, uh, but we hope to offer an entire mix that's that's built around your schedule as a paraprofessional. Great. Uh, another question is: Is there a certain amount of time you need to finish? Uh, a certain time? I think they mean the degree in order to qualify for the grant. I'm not 100% sure. I would have to check to see if the grant has any language like that. Because I know what you, uh, you know, I know there are some funds out there that said you need to complete your program in X amount of years. But for us in the special ed department, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Cash, we don't have a time frame on how long uh, you you must take to complete the degree. This is totally on your schedule, um, especially if you're a part-time student, you can be sure that this degree will take you a little bit longer because you're only taking one or two courses and we're open to that. That's why we want to um, use the continuing studies program because they have the flexibility to allow you to do those things. If you, we can get you done as fast or as slow as you want to finish this degree, that you know, if you if you are taking just a couple of courses at a time, that's absolutely fine. Uh, if you, uh, I, there may be a time limit on the grant program, and maybe Miss Pam can speak to that, or maybe uh, Robin or Sheena. I, 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 it seems like there was a time limit on the on the grant program. But uh, but as far as you finishing your degree with us, you will have our support for as long as you need it, for as long as it takes you to complete uh, the the program. Uh, and and the only time that we won't be able to that you'll have to take the 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 required amount of courses is when you do your when you do finally do your student teaching. You'll have to do a full, either eight weeks or sixteen weeks of student teaching all at one time. And uh, that's typically 12 hours uh, for the, uh, regardless of, of the length of time, it's 12 hours that you would take in one semester. 
So. I'll jump in about the paraprofessional teacher prep grant. I'm not aware of any timetable um, that uh, or any length of time, any limit on length of time that you can access the grant. Um, again, it is it's limited to supporting your undergraduate courses. That's good to know. Thank you. I couldn't remember if it was or not. Thank you, Ms. Pam. So far, those that's all we have for questions at the moment. Well, we really want you all to know we are available at any time of the day or night. You will see for admission questions, we have Dr. Ryan, I'm sorry, Mrs. Ryan's email address here. You have a link to the continuing studies pair webpage. Um, my email is s number one manuel at bridgew.edu. And we are always open for questions, any concerns, anything that comes to mind before you um, even apply to this program, we will be here waiting to answer those questions and provide guidance on whatever you may need. If we don't have the answers, we'll find someone who does, or we'll look around till we till we we figure it out. So we did get another question. Who can we contact to help us through the process? I'm gonna let Robin take that one. Sure. So I welcome you to reach out to me anytime. Um, my email address is the r2ryan at bridgew.edu. We can certainly schedule a virtual session like this where we can um, talk face to face just as we were in the in the office. Um, but we can do it at a mutually convenient time. If it's help getting the started with the application, uh, we can do that together. Um, the, really the only requirement once you get on and get started with the, app, the application, and that would be probably your first step unless you have very specific um, questions about the program or the academic side, um, you know, certainly we would get you connected with either Dr. Manuel, Dr. Cash, or um, the JET program so that you can get those questions answered. But if it's getting started in the application process, that would really be your first step. We would have you complete the application. Uh, we would ask you to submit your official transcripts and usually once we have a complete file the process is about seven to ten business days for us to get everything reviewed get you a decision we'll talk you um right through the process and then we work um once you're you're admitted i connect you immediately with dr manuel and you guys can then talk through the next steps of getting registered which classes fit for you and then if you need to circle back to me for assistance with getting registered, we're, I'm certainly here to help. So if you just need the initial point of contact because you don't know where to start, reach out to me anytime. And again, I'm more than happy to set up a one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's a telephone call, an email, a virtual um, meeting such as this, and we'll get you started on the right track. Another question uh, is, FAFSA application the first step? So the um, admissions, uh, you can do the admissions application and the FAFSA simultaneously. Some students do the FAFSA to get it out of the way first. Um, you will not get a response to your FAFSA application until you have com uh, completed and submitted your admissions application and gotten a decision. At that time, once both of those applications have been completed and Bridgewater State has issued your admissions decision, FAFSA and our financial aid office talk, your package, if you will, your financial aid package is determined. And at that time, you are um, given that information as well as a financial aid advisor who will help you through the steps of the process. Um, uh, and, and I am going to guess, and again, um, I'm going to defer to 
Pam Harrop for the answer to this question. Students would want to get their um, application for the grant um, completed as soon as possible. And if I'm not mistaken, I did read that there is a deadline of August 1st. Can someone confirm that? Yes, Robin, I'm so glad you brought that up. I had meant to mention that. Yeah, there it's it's um, you have to have applied for the paraprofessional grant by August 1st. And to apply for the paraprofessional grant, you have to have completed your FAFSA and had that approved. So it is a two step process for financial aid as well. And the para grant is open once a year. And you have to reapply every year. Uh, they're now giving uh, paras between April 1 and August 1. Uh, the time to do that application. Great. So your three, if, if you are thinking that you're ready to go for fall, you have three steps ahead of you that you absolutely must get done as soon as possible. Complete your FAFSA, complete your paraprofessional grant application, and submit your continuing studies um, application and your uh, request your official transcripts so that we can get moving we can get you a decision within you know the next 30 to 45 days so that you can be eligible for that grant for this upcoming academic year Robin I have a question because sometimes our paras have not um, filled out a FAFSA in the past okay and is there help at Bridgewater for yep. our filling out the FAFSA? Yes, absolutely. So we have some, A, we have some wonderful uh, tools that we can share out. So if students just want to reach out, send me an email, say, hey, can I have the access to those um, tools that you mentioned? I will absolutely provide you with the links. Our, our financial aid office is also very helpful in helping students navigate the application process. So we can ask for a general assistance in completing the FAFSA. You have, um, for, for those of you that are, are, are attending, that are still on our call, you know, we, we are here to provide you as many resources and as much help as possible. Um, reach out and ask for it. We're all here to support you. We want you to be successful. So anything that we can do to help ease the burden of taking all these steps by yourself, that's what we're here for. Um, you know, again, Dr. Manuel said she, she has been in the shoes of a paraprofessional. She knows the, the, the juggling that has to go on. Um, so, you know, she's a wonderful resource. I'm here. We in continuing studies understand what it's like to be an adult student trying to balance work, life, school, and everything else that's thrown at you, especially over this last year, you know, with the COVID coming and whoever saw that and, and how things got thrown upside down. So we are here to help you through everything that we possibly can. And as Dr. Manuel said, if we don't have the answer, we'll work with you to figure it out um, because it's probably not just you that's running into that situation. There's somebody else just like you um, or that question's going to come up again. So we'll be prepared the next time uh, it comes up. But, you know, uh, we had a student just recently who we helped through the process and her response to us, there was a team of us working with her and her response was, it takes a village. And it's true, we are your village here to support you as you go through this process. So please reach out to any one of us and we're more than happy to help you through these steps. It's a, it's a big undertaking. You've taken the biggest first step by being here today. And so from here on out, you've done the hard work. We're here to help you get through those next steps. And, and, and I would like to say too, that I know some of you may be may be worried about this, you may be afraid about this. You know, I want to encourage you just to you know go ahead and take this first step. It's 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 an exciting step towards the rest of your life, towards your future. 
I mean, everybody that's sitting here today at one time questioned whether or not they could get through college. I promise you. I know I did because I did not finish high school. I did, I did not finish my 11th grade year of high school. I quit, I quit the, after my sophomore year. So, you know, there was a time in my life I didn't think I'd ever go to college. And there was a time in my life where it took me about six years to get a four-year degree. So, you know, there's, there's, all of us have had fear about going to college, you know, but, but I want to encourage you just to take this, you know, if, if you're ready to take that step, go ahead and take that step. Everybody here has been there and we, and we you know, we want to be able to help you be successful. We're here, you know, we're not here uh, for any other purpose other than for you to be successful in this endeavor. So, so don't let your fear hold you back. Thank you. So we do have a couple more questions. Uh, first, what's a transcript and how do I attain, obtain it? Okay, so your transcript, if you attended another academic institution and earned college credits, you will ha have the ability to reach out to their, uh, what they call their registrar's or office or their bursar and request a transcript, request an official transcript. Most schools if you go on to their website so for example either massasoit community college or bristol community college those are the two i'm very familiar with and i know their websites uh if when you go to their home page in their search box if you just type in official transcript request it will bring you to a link that you can click on most of them are you can request that it be sent electronically there's usually a minimum fee, a, a couple of dollars, two or three. I think the last time I saw a Bristol Community College was three fifty a transcript, but I could be wrong. Um, and you can have it. You can request to have it sent to Bridgewater State University directly. It can come to me. That is fine at the R two Ryan at bridgew.edu. It can be sent to the CCS at bridgew.edu and some institutions just have it set up other institutions have their systems set up so that it will come to the admission office at bridgewater the main admissions mailbox and, and it will get to us um, so that's a transcript essentially tells you what courses you took at another institution and what how, how you were graded what your scores were were you an a student a b student did you do really well uh did you withdraw from your classes so it gives us kind of a, an overall academic picture of who you are but do, again you know to dr cash's point don't let something like that scare you or deter you um we have working solutions for just about every every issue that comes up so we do have more questions um I have a question about the grant. It isn't need-based, correct? We have to complete the FAFSA as part of the process, even if we may not be eligible for financial aid other than the grant. All right. It's not a need-based. The only requirement is that you're a paraprofessional. And if you're a paraprofessional for less than two years, then you're majoring for an undergraduate degree in those areas like special education and math and science. But you do need to complete the FAFSA as part of the process. Okay, so here's another question. What if you've never been to college before and don't have any transcripts? Are you not eligible for the grant? don't see why you wouldn't be eligible. There, I, I don't believe I read anything to the contrary. So if you have never been to college and this is your first um, go around, welcome and congratulations. Um, and it, it is quite all right. Um, you're still eligible to apply. Uh, apply, you would apply for your FAFSA um, and we'll work with you on, um, you know, making sure that you're getting the core curriculum as well as getting your coursework um, through this, the specific concentration of special education that you're looking to go through. Um, but I do not have, and I don't know if Pam is still with us, if she is 
aware of any um, any restrictions for students who have never been to school before? No, there is none. Perfect. And Fantastic. I've never been to school before then, and you're going to start now, and you have the chance to have the paraprofessional grant support you through your entire undergraduate uh, career. So um, great, great time to start. Awesome, thank you. That was the last question we've had posted so far. And I'm just going to say something, you know, JET started actually down on the south coast in Fall River and New Bedford. Um, we, we had paras apply. They had to provide their transcripts. Some uh, people were not very proud. You know, they had gone to college very early on before they really knew perhaps what they wanted to do. Um, I can tell you that the paras who graduated, almost without exception, graduated with honors in their undergraduate degree, which is pretty extraordinary. And it, it really, I think, can be attributed to their desire, their being motivated, and knowing where they want to get. So um, if you know that, um come aboard i agree if you're passionate and you're ready and you're already interested in being in the classroom and you're a paraprofessional right now this is the perfect opportunity for you like you will have all of the resources available to you between um all of us here in school out of school and i can tell you i'm the same with dr cash that first uh, those first few years of undergraduate school, I'm telling you, I have the transcript to show you that one year it was just straight F's. I flunked out. I didn't even have the nerve to go to the, um, or even the know-how to go to the office to withdraw from the college to uh, avoid the F's being on my transcript. I learned that through the process the hard way. I didn't have all of that information available to me. So now if you're coming in and this is your first time thinking about going into um, any degree program or program of study, this is the perfect opportunity. And I feel like we are um, some of the best people to talk to to get you through that process. Are there any final questions or thoughts? I know that we're a little over our, our allotted time um, and we certainly don't want to keep um, our attendees any longer than necessary. Again, we understand that you've taken time out of your very busy day, but we also don't want to cut you short. So if you do have questions, feel free to either type them in the box or um, you know, we'll certainly kind of linger for a little bit longer. Um, but if it's time for you and you need to jump off, by all means, feel free. You know how to reach us. You will be receiving the email um, thanking you for attending and providing you with that uh, waiver code. Um, so please reach out. Let us know how we can help and support you. And we look forward to having you in the classroom very soon.